have quite a bit of services and screenings available for those who attend. So we will have the glucose screening, we'll have the blood pressure screening, BMI screening. Uh, we will have two different massage places, um, giving hand massages and things like that, just to promote overall heart health, mental health, and all of that. So um, we will also have breakfast and coffee, so it'll be bright and early. If you would like to join us, it's going to be tomorrow from 8 to 10 in our front lobby. Um, and then we also gave out the flyer for our next Doc Talk. So as you know, during the month of February, we have quite a few because it is Heart Month. So next week, next Thursday, and then the following Thursday, the 13th and the 20th, the same room, 5.30 p.m., um, the same uh, information, but we will have different positions. If you all have any questions, I know that the number to RSVP wasn't on here, um, but if you would like to RSVP, you can call 365-1027. Uh, it's 365-1027. Um, or these flyers will actually also be out in the community, so you'll be able to see the ones for the upcoming weeks. And those are the next events that are coming up here at Huntington Medical Center. You also would have received a flyer here for the South Heart Clinic, which has the different physicians that are there. Um, and one of the physicians that are, is going to be presenting today, um, or two of our physicians actually, we're going to have Dr. Hilmi and Dr. Morales speaking. So um, first we're going to have Dr. Hilmi. Before he comes up, I'm going to go ahead and introduce him. Um, and then in a bit, Lisa, who is Dr. Morales' RN, will be speaking um, and she'll be introducing him. So uh, for Dr. Hilmi, Dr. Hilmi is a board-certified interventional cardiologist with extensive experience in multiple cardiac subspecialties. He is a graduate of All India Medi Institute of Medical Sciences and completed the, his postgraduate medical training at New York Medical College which included a medical internship and med medical residency in general cardiology and interventional cardiology. Um, he was, along with Dr. Blake, one of the founders of the Heart Clinic Group, which is an organization that revolutionized cardiology practice in the Rio Grande Valley. Dr. Hilmi was involved in, in initiating multiple programs for cardiac care since his arrival in RGV, such as coronary stenting, nuclear cardiology, and carotid artery angioplasty and stenting. He is board certified in the specialty of internal medicine, the subspecialty of cardiovascular diseases and NASTE HRS, electrophysiology certified cardiac device management. Uh, Dr. Hilmi is also the chief of cardiology and director of the cardiac catheterization lab at Heart Engine Medical Center. Dr. Hilmi and his partners at the South Heart Clinic do welcome new patients who require cardiac care. So if you guys um, can all please help me welcome Dr. Sheree Hilmi. Everybody hear me well in the back? Yeah. Awesome. So today was supposed to be a, a talk with two separate physicians. In a sense, I feel good that Dr. Morales hasn't showed up because he has an excellent attire, usually with a bow tie, and makes <laughs> us look bad. He really makes us all look bad. So uh, I'm going to take my moment of glory till he shows up. If you actually look at the flyer, you see his picture. He's always with a bow tie. I have no idea how he does it but he does it. So I was, the, the discussion today was supposed to be about how newer things are happening in cardiology. And it's really important to see that this is a process that's been evolving for thousands of years. How is that important? So we have the lights on a bit. So when you look at medicine in general, this is actually in Arabic. And I can read it because I was born in Egypt. <laughs> Actually, that's all I read and wrote till I was uh, 17 years of age when I came here. I had to go to 12th grade. That wasn't fun because I wrote from right to left and we had to go switch around. <laughs> a bit, of a, bit of, a, of a deal there, but anyway. So this just shows you that in ancient Egypt, they did a trephining operation. What a trephining operation is is to release a subdural hematoma, which is a collection of blood around the, the brain that can actually compress the brain. So this is about four or 5,000 years old. And why am I showing you these slides? Because it's important to know that we don't have one particular event that revolutionizes medicine. We usually build up upon different prior events. So when we have uh, the Ford Model T was built, 
They didn't have adaptive cruise control and windshield wipe. They didn't have any of those things. But certainly the cars today learned from the prior stuff that was being done in 1900, 1910, 1940, 1950, and built upon that and improved the function of the current cars, okay? So this is again, discovery of brain surgery. This was 1600 BC. If you know the math back then, it's a lot. This is a breast abscess drainage, and this is written in, uh, in uh, the Arabic literature and on papyrus paper. Wow. So this is stuff that's been going on. So when we have somebody that's having a breast abscess drainage, it's not new. It's just that we do it so much better now, so much better. So I was tasked by the powers that be to talk about newer things, and I picked three separate topics that I wanted to talk to you about. I'm supposed to talk really fast because Dr. Murad is supposed to show up. I'm not buying it <laughs> because he's still putting on his bow tie. But <laughs> so the, the first thing I have to talk to you about is the new concept of a key car. It stands for transcarotid artery repair. This is, carotid surgery has been around since the late 50s and early 60s. Again, not a novel thing, it's a newer modality with which we are improving upon pre-existing stuff that we had before. So when we look at this key car, it was actually not around 10 years ago. And if you look at the endovascular procedures that are being done, can, is it possible to get the lights down again so we can see this a bit better? I don't know if it's Okay, any better? So if you look at the, the vascular procedures that are being done now, uh, the, the green stuff or the whatever that color is, is 79% being done by non-invasive. This was a novel thing 40 years ago, 30 years ago. Most of the work that was being done, we were cutting patients open. We were cutting patients open to do anything we had to do. So uh, an exploratory laparotomy was opening the belly to see what's happening inside. That was very common when I started my surgical training. Now you know what an exploratory laparotomy is? It's a CAT scan, <laughs> right? We don't have to open the body to see things. <coughs> so if you look at the for coronary artery disease, 76% of the procedures are done by catheter-based technology. Just putting an IV or a catheter and, and getting inside the artery. You get the same thing for aortic aneurysm repair, abdominal 70%. And for peripheral artery disease, the majority are being done without opening the body, which is a really important concept, okay? So carotid disease, in the, in the current literature, the surgery is still predominant, which is the opposite of all the other disease processes. So what are we doing now? We're modifying those things. So now, only 17% are being done by, by carotid interventions that are without surgery. So if you look at the surgical exploration to do a carotid artery repair, old-fashioned way, it's basically you, the incision is made from about the lower end of the ear, uh, just at the angle of the jaw, and it extends usually down to the base of the neck. It's a pretty, pretty significant surgery. It has its own uh, you know, complications and, and, and adverse effects. So when we decided to do carotid stenting by doing catheter-based technologies, we were actually here at Hanji, one of the medical centers that participated in what we call the worldwide trial, the Sapphire Worldwide Trial. And we've done about, uh, in that trial, we've done about 150 carotid uh, stents. And cumulatively, we've done about 900 carotid stents. So the carotid stent was a very, very attractive uh, option because you go from a femoral artery with a catheter and you go and you put a stent in here. Well, we put in a bolic protection device to prevent clots or, or stuff from moving up to the brain and giving us many strokes. But still, the stroke rate was still higher than we wanted to see it, okay? So now, with this new system, again, an improvement of pre-existing work, this is called key card. Instead of making an incision from here to here, you make a small incision in this area, which is usually about a centimeter and a half, and then we go on to avoid any of the bigger uh, surgeries and we have an advantage of having the ability to put a stent in and the, a 
ability to minimize this type of absurdity in space. So what we do is we get a catheter under direct vision into the carotid artery, usually at the base of the neck. And once we do that, we are able to put a stent in. But the novel thing about this particular technique is that we do something called flow reversal. So when we get the catheter into the carotid artery, we take the blood flow from the carotid artery and we make it go backwards and it goes into the femoral vein through a filter. And that filter takes all the clots out of the way, okay? So normally the blood would go up upstream and if there's any piece of little fajita or tortilla <laughs> that's left over or something, like that, it'll just go upstream and give people a stroke. And the stroke rate in the best of hands with carotid stenting is still about three to four percent. Okay, so with this technique, we are sucking the blood out of the carotid artery, back into this filter and into the vein. And so you don't have any blood flowing forward, which is really a novel idea. What does that do? It gives us a lot of advantages, okay? We use a simple axis, we have a neuroprotection, we have a guide wire and a stent, and sometimes we use a balloon to try. So let's look at what the numbers look like. So when you look at the stroke rate in high surgical risk patients, 1.4% for people who have this technique being utilized. For the standard carotid endarterectomy or the open surgical approach, it's 2.3%. For the carotid stent, it's 4.1%. So when you look at this, it's less than half of all of these. So definitely an improvement, not only in, in, in uh, results, but in side effects, complications, length of stay in the hospital, the, the other what we call comorbid conditions like people with heart attacks, people who have, uh, you know, bleeding, infection, requirement for blood transfusion, all that is less with this device. So I basically started doing these procedures here about maybe a year and a half or two ago, and so far we've done about 40, I think, and so far we've had no major uh, issues. So all the studies, particularly this study called the Rosenberg study, which is famous, has compared all of the patients with similar age criteria and looked at them and looked at the major stroke rate and minor stroke rate, death, heart attack, all stroke, injury of a cranial nerve, and looked at all those numbers, and they were excellent in that technique compared to regular open carotid surgery, okay? So you look at the, the TCAR stroke rate is 2.0. 1.9%, and that's twice as high a risk for, for patients who are routinely being done. Now, we know that men die younger than women and have serious problems, and this is probably one of the reasons that this happens. So we have to be really careful with what we do. So the second thing I needed to talk to you about today is aortic valve disease. Once again, Aortic valve surgery from Lily High and, and, um, and people with uh, the Mayo brothers, they started doing aortic valve replacement surgery back in the 50s, late 50s. And they had a ball in cage and they, then they developed further and further and further. Well then we realized all of a sudden that there are some patients who cannot have heart surgery. For example, people with bad lungs or people who have a weak heart muscle or people who have some other major conditions that would make their surgical risk much higher. So came the, the prospect of having what we call a TAVR approach, and I'm gonna go over that with you in a bit. This is a cross-section of a healthy aortic valve. So if you take the aortic valve, the aortic root is about a little bit bigger than a garden hose. So if you cut it and look down the barrel, this is what you see. You see the leaflets of the aortic valve, that's when it's closed, when this opens, you open this and you open that and you open that and the blood comes out. And normally the force of the blood forces the valve open, okay? But when you look at a diseased valve, it's full of calcium and the better expression is crud, really. It's a lot of you know, calcified material on top of it. So it actually restricts its opening. So the body is not getting the blood that it needs. So we have a problem with lack of blood supply to the brain and all that. So you look at the numbers and basically you wanna make sure that the valve that's being replaced 
has the appropriate indications. And you have to make sure that that's done in a multidisciplinary approach with patients that have the right indication, the right uh, reason for having a valve replacement surgery. A lot of patients that, so asymptomatic in medicine means that they're not having symptoms. When you look at patients who are not having symptoms, if you, are, if you happen to be a couch potato and you're not doing anything, you may never have symptoms. So some people say, well, I feel good, but you're not doing anything. You take the same set of patients and you have them walk on a treadmill and they can't do two minutes. All of a sudden, they're short of breath. They're not really without symptoms. It's just that they're avoiding the things that they would do that would give them symptoms. So some patients will decide, you know, I used to walk a mile a day, but now when I walk a half a mile, I get chest discomfort or I get short of breath, so I'm gonna walk a quarter of a mile. Or am I gonna walk? So that's a part of that subset of patients. But when you have symptoms, fatigue or shortness of breath, uh, people who have fainting or dizziness, that's a bad, bad sign when they have aortic narrowing uh, with it. So that becomes a, a major issue. So we have to assess patients who have a heart murmur. A good, by the way, I have to emphasize this. I don't know how to say this any better. A lot of the younger physicians are trained to, to rely on ancillary studies. So people basically wait for a CAT scan or an echo or an MRI, but sometimes if you don't suspect a particular problem, you may not order that particular test that you need. So back in our days, this is my CAT scan. <coughs> my hand, my ears, my ability to assess patients. So <coughs> we carry that over by assessing patients appropriately. You have to find what the, the likelihood of an abnormality is in the, in the basic valve structure that you see. Could be the mitral valve, the aortic valve, or whatever. Then there's other things that can be done like cardiac catheterization, which gives us a definitive amount of information regarding what the, the valve is like. This is the valve that is now being introduced via the femoral artery. So we put a catheter in and get it all the way into where the valve <coughs> used to be or was, into that <coughs> narrowed valve, we put a balloon across it, crush that valve open, and put this device in all by a cath catheter-based technology. And so this valve fits on a, on a sheath that's compressed. When you get it where you want it to be, you pull that sheath back and the valve is designed to open when warmed. So it's made of a light and light, light and all substance. And interestingly enough, as it warms, it expands. So if you cool the valve, it's gonna get, get smaller again, it shrinks. So if you heat it to the body temperature, to the current temperature that we have, it starts to expand. And this is one of the, the two uh, major companies that, that make uh, this valve. There's a valve that's opened up with a balloon, and there's a valve that expands on its own. And this has been really a very, very good uh, product for us. When people have an assessment for possible valve replacement, what we call percutaneously, via a puncture hole, this procedure is called TABR, or transcutaneous aortic valve replacement, transfemoral aortic valve replacement. They have a whole bunch of stuff that needs to be done ahead of time. We have to look at their CAT scan, the ultrasound, the labs, the electrocardiogram, physical exam. Have you noticed how they put it on the number five or six here? It's supposed to be up here. And they have there's something called ST, STS score, which is the Society of Thoracic Surgery score, to assess the risk for, for surgery. We look at, at uh, other factors that we look at New York Heart Association classification and we look at the cardiac catheterization findings. We put that all together and we work as a team. We have to get a whole bunch of people that, that work together to make a determination of how this particular individual is suited for a particular procedure. So we have cardiac surgeons, cardiologists, we have interventional radiologists, we have anesthesiologists. We all work together as a team. When I do an aortic valve you know, replacement by this protocol, there's usually about 15 people standing in the room. Each one is doing one thing, but they work together as a team collectively to see how we can get uh, the best uh, possible result. So that's what I was basically talking to you about, a whole bunch of, of the vascular program. So when you look at the incidence of severe aortic stenosis, if, if you look at the extreme risk patients, or the really high risk patients, 13%, and that's where TAVR, or the 
percutaneous valve replacement was being indicated for. And so the studies are now showing that more of the intermediate risk and the low risk patients are now suitable candidates. So just like balloon angioplasty and stenting was being done only for patients that couldn't have heart surgery in the past, like aneurysm repair was being done by, balloon, by, by catheter technology in patients who could not have an open surgery in the past, all those things are changing. So now, for aneurysms, for example, the therapy is first to do the aneurysm by a percutaneous approach, minimally invasive. If that doesn't work, then you consider surgery. It's the exact opposite. It's a, it's a shift in, in, in thought process, okay? And so, if you look at the development, this evolution system has been developed and improved upon, improved upon, improved upon, and now it's a lot smaller. So before it was what we call a, a 24 French sheath, which is a bigger sheath. Now it's down to 18 French sheath, which is the smaller. It's, it's counterintuitive. It's the, the higher the number, the smaller the, the, the sheath size. So it's, it's, and it's continuing to improve. And they, they have, so this is the catheter that we put in. So we slide this catheter all the way over a wire into where the valve is supposed to be, and then we open it with this device to look like that. It's really cool. I'm excited. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> You're not laying there. <laughs> He's not doing it, right? So when you look at comparison for all cause mortality of stroke and, and all that, over a period of five years or 10 years, depending on the study that you look at, it's fairly cool. So this is surgical aortic valve replacement. This is the one that I was talking to you about, the TAVR. And all parameters, stroke is a little less than with the surgery. Major stroke is about the same. But if you look at the survival, so now the new technology is stepping up to the plate and matching the established technology. In medicine, there's something called the gold standard. So the gold standard for carotid surgery was carotid endarterectomy or open surgery. The gold standard for aneurysm repair was open surgery. It's changing. It continues to change and continues to evolve. Like the gold standard for doing the brain stuff that the ancient Egyptians were, do, were doing is different now. It took 5,000 years, but it's different. So the aortic valve is accessed from a femoral artery. Sometimes you go from an axillary artery, and sometimes you go direct function. And all roads lead to Rome. So if you get a catheter in any part of the body, you can get to any part of the body, basically. You, just, you have to follow the road, and it gets you there. You know what you're doing. You don't have a bad sense of direction. It's a bad idea. <laughs> to have a bad sense. I have a terrible sense of direction outside the body. Inside the body, I'm pretty good. <laughs> so the Evolu design sits right where the previous aortic valve was. And we have to be very careful not to block those coronary arteries, because those would be uh, essential to supply the, the heart with blood. And that's why men die younger than women. They keep watching. <laughs> Any luck with Dr. Morales? Um, Did he get his bow tie on yet? <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> so the third topic I'm going to talk to you about is abdominal aortic aneurysm. Once again, aneurysms have been fixed since the 50s and 60s. Um, I don't know if any of you guys have heard of or had an abdominal aortic aneurysm open repair. It's a horrendous surgery. It's a very morbid surgery. The aorta sits behind everything in the body. And so we have to open the body from the lower end of the chest all the way down to the goodies. The intestines are put in a plastic bag and tossed on the side. We have to clamp the aorta on top and clamp the aorta on the bottom. And even with skilled surgeons, you interrupt the blood supply to half of the body for anywhere from 45 minutes to an hour, an hour and a half, depending on the complexity of, of the disease. And that has a lot of, of morbidities with it, okay? So AAA is the North American Automobile Association with abdominal aortic <laughs> aneurysm. That's what we usually refer to this uh, as in, in, the, in the business. And these are just renders, renderings of CAT scan images that are compiled just to show how good the CAT scans are. Don't have to open up. You can see it, okay? So an aneurysm is defined when you have an area of an artery that measures twice of the normal segment. 
So if you have an artery that measures two centimeters here and it's four centimeters here, that's an aneurysm, okay? The aneurysms are not usually messed with unless they have a particular indication, and I'm gonna go over that with you in a bit. So why is aneurysm a big deal? Because most people don't know about an aneurysm even if they have it. So the most common symptom of an aneurysm is no symptom. What's the next most common symptom? Death. So you go from nothing to rupture. Now there are some people that can pay attention to some subtleties, like for example, uh, some people have a sense of bloating, or the intestines are being pushed aside so they can't have as much food as they used to before. Some people have back pain. A lot of people who have back pain have back pain because of spinal issues or some lumbar problem or something like that. So it's difficult to detect. Uh, some people have abdominal discomfort, just a sense of, of uh, feeling poor in general. When the aneurysm expands, that's when they start getting symptoms. If the aneurysm ruptures, very, very few people will survive that. They have to be lucky to be in a hospital that deals with aneurysm repair and have a team there ready. Otherwise, they're, they're in, in trouble, okay? So it's the 13th leading cause of death, 1.5 to 2 million people in the US a year. And it increases with age. And as we are all getting healthier, we're getting older. So we're seeing more people with aneurysms that would People who, if you look at the life expectancy in the 50s, 1950, 1960, it was probably 70, 72 years old. But we're now the life expectancy is getting to be 82, 84 on average. Doesn't mean that we have to check out at that time, but that's the average, okay? So it's more frequent in men, and I showed you in the previous slide why men die younger, right? And it occurs more frequently in Caucasians, surprisingly, because it's often associated with high blood pressure which is more common in blacks. But this disease is more common in Caucasians, and nobody really understands why. Uh, it's a, an idiosyncrasy of the situation. So what are the symptoms? They have no symptoms till they rupture. Big abdominal pain, throbbing, uh, ex expansion of the aneurysm may cause some discomfort, flank pain or back pain. When you feel your tummy is pulsating, that's a bad sign. Some people have nausea, weight loss. Now, lower extremity emboli, basically when you have an aneurysm that sits in the aorta, in the outside of the aneurysm, the, the, the central part usually the blood is flowing, but the outside the blood becomes stagnant, so you develop clots. And these clots can move downstream and block some of the arteries uh, down the, the, the pipe. So these are examples of different types of aneurysms. There's one, so this is the normal segment of the vessel. Those are the kidney arteries, and those are the arteries that go to the groin. So the groin is down here. The heart is up in the ceiling, the second floor, and this is the aneurysm area. That's called fusiform. Fusiform means it goes in a, in a general widening. It's not one area, it's the whole thing is moving. This on the other hand, here are the kidney arteries again, and here are those iliac arteries like here. But here that's called secular. What does secular mean? You know, we'd like to use fancy words. It means sac like. It's like a sac. It usually protrudes to one side rather than generalized, okay? Those are much more likely to rupture than those because the pressure is all directed to one side. There's a weakness in the vessel on one side. So basically, the walls become thinner. They start bulging, or you get a tear in the inside vessel, in the inside of the liner. People get a rupture, or they start <coughs> narrowing, or they start having a dissection that extends to other uh, vessels. Okay. When you have a rupture, it's extreme distress, severe back pain, hypotension means low blood pressure, fast heart rate. You will become pale, sweaty. It becomes shocking. It means the blood pressure drops, and not a lot of time, not a lot of time, okay? High mortality, 50% with untreated aneurysms who have more than 5.5 centimeters would die of rupture within a five year period. So if you have an aneurysm that measures 5.5 centimeters, you have a 50% chance of dying within five years. 
That's like playing Russian roulette with three bullets and sticks. Right? It's a serious business. So emergency cases, 50% of the emergency people that come in into the hospital at the time of presentation will actually survive at, in the best of hands in expert setting. Okay? So the reason I mentioned that, I have no idea what happened to this guy. He's supposed to be back there. So the reason I mentioned that is to emphasize the importance of screening. If you have a toothache, it bugs you enough to go to the dentist. But if you have an aneurysm that you're not really aware of, it is really important to have screening. So screening basically, again, people who are in the right age group, Caucasians and males, we already agreed that males have a higher incidence and Caucasians have a higher incidence. People with high blood pressure, people who have cholesterol deposits in other parts of the body, they have a higher incidence. Smokers, diabetics not so much. But physical exam, palpation means putting your hand on the patient, God forbid. Putting your hand on the patient is really important. Ultrasound screening is the gold standard, as I mentioned, for assessment of the patient. It's a simple test, it's benign, it doesn't cause any side effects, it gives us tremendous information. We can actually measure the aneurysm size. We can also track the aneurysm. We can measure it in six months. So if it's four centimeters, we measure it in six months. It's still four centimeters, we have to take it easy. If it goes from four to five and a half, we say, wait a minute, something is cooking. And so this is one of the methods with which we can actually assess this. If you look at the control group of, of patients compared to the screen groups, so the screen groups that had deaths, zero compared to three, one compared to three, two compared to seven, two compared to 15, four compared to 21. So this is looking at different years, year one, year two, year three, year four, year five. The ones that have been screened have lived a lot shorter than, than the ones, sorry, have lived a lot longer than the ones who have not been screened. Does that make sense? So screening is important. Screening is very important. Because sometimes it's not so obvious that you have a, a problem. So you have to go with ultrasound <laughs> assessment and, and other things. Now we know that some men are macho, and this is a disease of men, and some men want to bury their heads in the sand like an ostrich because they think it's not happening, or they don't want to know that it's happening. I mean, I see this a lot. So we have to do some testing. Some of the times we have to do the testing for a good reason, as you know, but sometimes it really means that we can address issues. What do we have to do when we have somebody with an abdominal aortic aneurysm? You can watch and wait. Sometimes that's appropriate. If somebody is not having symptoms, if somebody does not have the right size of an aneurysm to require any intervention, <coughs> or if somebody doesn't want to have any intervention, or somebody is too sick to have an intervention. So we can watch and wait. Open surgical repair, it's a horrendous procedure as I mentioned. So you want to avoid that as much as possible. It may be the best option, and if it is, then that's what we have to do. But if you can get away without doing that, it's a better option. So when we look at endovascular repair, certainly is the most attractive because it has a whole bunch of, of benefits and a lot less risk. So this is something we alluded to before. When you have an aneurysm between five and six, your chance of dying is 25%. When it gets to six to seven, 35%. More than seven, it's 75%. From the aneurysm. Don't forget that people who have aneurysms can have other problems that will give them a bad <coughs> outcome, like strokes or heart attacks that may not be related to the aneurysm. But basically, you want to make sure that you prevent death from an aneurysm. So this is the surgery for, it doesn't look this pretty when we off, by the way. It really does not look like that at all. So you have an aneurysm that sits behind things, bow tie on. Oh, the, the man is here. <laughs> See, see what I mean? See what I mean, guys? <laughs> look, I, I told him you're going to make us look back. <laughs> look, you're really fine. So I said everything nice about surgery, and I said nothing about what we do. <laughs> so basically, w this is the type of procedure that has to be done. The problem with that is that 
one in 20 patients would have a complication, so 5% death, 10 days usually in the hospital, one, to ten, one in 10 would have it discharged to an outpatient facility, like long-term care, and vascular procedures for aneurysm happen again with the open repair. This is how Dr. Morales would do it, open the, the, the aorta, put a graft in, and then sew the aorta back on and tie the end to the end. Okay, So this is clearly the gold standard for repair. Then men still die before <laughs> women do. So this is another form of aneurysm repair when it goes up in the chest cavity. And one of these, I have to really hurry up now because Dr. Morales is here. One of the complications is impotence for men. So endovascular therapy or catheter-based therapy without opening the patient have a number of <coughs> advantages, which is basically reduced morbidity and mortality, high technical success rate with the development of newer devices. Things are getting better and better. Low incidence of the need for another procedure. Low incidence of surgical conversion and it's effective in preventing rupture in over 99% of patients. So that's a definite uh, deal. So you look at the, uh, I was actually looking at the statistics that we have for uh, the heart clinic and for the uh, general public, but that's, so this is what the graph looks like for the, uh, for the aorta. Basically it comes in composite in pieces, put together. This is the main device that introduces it. And as you can see, it's very flexible because the arteries are not straight shot. The arteries turn. So we're actually able to slide this through uh, any place we want to most of the time. And this is the, the handle that helps us open up that graft. And it starts to open and look like that. And then, so we go in with a puncture here as opposed to opening the whole thing. And we're actually able to slide it over here. And so this is from the groin goes up to one side, and we start opening it up a little bit. And once it's open, it has a hole on the other side, and we go from the other side and go inside that hole, and then we put another limb. And so this blood flow now is directed through there. It doesn't touch the aneurysm. So the aneurysm is prevented from being exposed to the pressure of the body and minimizes the chance of rupture. It's like saying if you have an inner tube of a bicycle that has a, a bulge on it, if you put another inner tube inside that, it doesn't matter what happens to that bulge. The air stays in the tire. That's the, the concept. Okay. So basically, these are some of our patients that we did here. We've got a, a pregnant person from Mars or something. And this is what it looks like afterwards. So you put a graft inside, and basically the aneurysm is still there, but it's not getting any blood flow. It's not getting any pressure. Uh, this is a person who had a, a chest. Uh, this was actually a, a young, a young uh, man who was a very interesting guy. He, he <coughs> was driving and he hit a dog or something. So he went out to check in front of his car, and another car hit his car and hit him. So he ruptured his aorta, but had a, a what we call a contained rupture. So he came in. He had a broken arm, broken leg, broken ribs like 22 years of age. So we did this and, and put a graft in to fix him. And the following morning he asked, when, I can, when can I go home? I said, Jesus, man, <laughs> you just had a major deal happen. Give it, give it rest. So it's nice to be a wise man and, and uh, think uh, smartly. This is a, a gorilla I saw in the zoo, in the Brownsville Zoo. And I was amazed at how this huge, humongous thing had balanced itself on this little wooden thing. And I thought it was very interesting. Bottom line is 97% will do well, and I think we've nailed this particular thingy. And this is the development of the human being so far, as we have become more and more. And that's my late dog, who is very cute, but very uh, stubborn. And there she is in the, in the dishwasher uh, on my son's foot. And I leave you with this, I'm in time. <laughs> it's yours. Can we ask questions? Yes. Yes. 
We can ask, Dr. Morales will ask her better than me. Yes. Okay. okay. Uh, well, all right. Have to get and then we'll have to give you some more time. Okay. Okay. We're just yeah. good. My name is Lisa. I work with uh, Dr. Morales. Um, Dr. Morales has a group of three surgeons. Um, we work in Corpus Christi, McAllen, Harlingen, and Brownsville, and I was asked to introduce him today. Uh, Dr. Morales is a longtime cardiothoracic surgeon, originally from San Luis Potosí, Mexico, who established his practice in Corpus Christi. Some would say he lives a hectic life, but it's one that he's happy to live. Dr. Morales began studying medicine at age 18 and graduated three years later as valedictorian. He practiced medicine in his native country of Mexico before heading to the United States to study general surgery in Massachusetts and cardiothoracic surgery at West Virginia University. From there, he took a fellowship in congenital heart surgery in London before coming back to the United States to start his practice in Corpus Christi. In the last year, in 2019 alone, Dr. Morales performed just under 600 heart surgeries on adult and pediatric patients. Dr. Morales is happily married to his wife, Patty, and the two of them have three kids together. Dr. Morales is a selfless, selfless physician leader here in the RGV and Corpus, who I'm happy to call my boss and my friend. <laughs> well, that's quite the introduction, huh? Um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, Dr. Kidney pretty much has brought you up to speed to uh, about everything that is new. And um, really, the, in, in reality, can you hear me okay? The um, more volume. Ready? Okay. So the the, the, the whole idea of uh, of uh, presenting this to try to bring you up to speed and, and what's new and and, and, and and cardiovascular interventions and surgery. You know, with the new with the advent of new technology, you know, surgeons and, and cardiologists come together every time more and more and. Whereas before we had separate practices, you know, the cardiologists would see patients in the office and we would just operate. Now we work together quite often. So by, by maximizing our, our, our cooperation, we minimize the intervention on the patient. So, you know, they'll do stents and do, we'll do little cuts instead of big incisions. So we'll do endovascular repairs, right? The big open surgeries. And, and everything is tried to, to, to make sure that the patient has the best intervention with a minimal amount of, uh, of, in, of, of invasion. And, and of course, that, that, that hastens recovery and it gets you back to life a lot faster. So what I, what I was gonna touch upon, I'm just gonna talk to you a little bit about minimally invasive valve surgery. In general, of course, cardio, cardio, cardiothoracic surgery, everybody talks about open heart surgery, just means that you see someone with a big incision in the chest and that's open heart surgery. And of course, we still do that a lot. That probably the most common. But you know, I, I would say for valve surgery or a lot of the you know selective coronary surgeries, we do little incisions on the on this either side of the chest and that you know allows the patient to have the same type of operation with very small incisions and, 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 and with, with a flat faster recovery. Usually after you have an open heart surgery, um, the heart's good to go from the time you finish immediately. You know, starts getting new blood and or, or you, you just change a valve, the heart's performing fine like an engine. You know, you change, you oil it or you overhaul it and it starts working perfectly. How, however, the, the, the body, you know, it lags behind. It takes a while for the body to catch up. And the reason is that there's significant amount of trauma for us to get inside the chest cavity. We gotta go through the breastbone, which is, you know, of course, a bone, much like uh, the arm or your leg. When, when we break it and then we put it together, it's gotta heal. And that healing process of the bone takes about six weeks. So that really puts you behind when, when you really think about it. Even though you, you feel good, your heart's, you know, performing well and your blood pressure and everything's good, the rest of the body takes takes good six weeks to heal. So anything that we can do to prevent you from going through that, it's, it's, it's what we try to do. So minimum invasive surgery, endovascular surgery, percutaneous approaches, everything that we try to do that you, you've heard today is try to get you back, you know, back to your, your home and, and back to work and back to enjoying the things that you do a lot faster and with a lot less pain. 
So I am going to try to talk to you a little bit about um, minimum invasive surgery. Where, where is the? Hit the right side of the clicker. Right side, right side of the clicker. Okay. All right. So the, the, the short for minimum invasive cardiac surgery, we call it MIX. So when you see it in the sketch, you'll see you know, a MIX procedure. That's short for minimum invasive heart surgery. And um, what you see, 12% of cardiothoracic surgeons do minimum invasive heart surgery in the United States. And that's really not a lot when you think, you know, this is a big country. And then you think about it, most people still do big incisions because that's, that's how we're trained. And, 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 and only about 10 to 12% do it. And I'd be happy to tell you that here, I, I think pretty much that's all we do. We, we don't even do big incisions for, for valve surgery unless we have to combine them with another procedure. So this is, this is the, the conventional approach is what's called a mid-sternotomy where you, know, you have an incision from, you have an incision from the first, where is the, there it is, an incision from, from the top of the sternum all the way down to the, from what we call the manubrium all the way down to the side, where, which is the top and the bottom of the sternum. And that's how we split the bone, we open the pericardium and we expose the whole heart. Of course the lungs will be in either side. And that's the majority of, of, of surgeries, that's traditional heart surgery. A minimum invasive approach with a little keyholes through the, either the 40 Ticosa space or through the 30 Ticosa space or through the 30 Ticosa space over here. So it depends on what side of the heart we, 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 we want to we approach. Like for the aortic valve, we go right here. For the mitral valve, we go right here. For coronary surgery, we go over here. So we just use the, the closest area possible to the heart. So the advantage, of course, faster recovery. Within three weeks, you're pretty much back to doing whatever you want. It still hurts, you know, I'm not gonna tell you that it doesn't, it just it hurts, but, but it doesn't immobilize you. It doesn't, you can lift, you can move around, you can cough, I mean, you can laugh, you can drive. Now, it's still gonna smart a little bit when you sneeze, cough, or, 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 or laugh, you know, it'll, it, it'll be there for, for a while, but, but by three weeks, you pretty much certainly can go back to work and do whatever you wanna do. The, of course, cos cosmetic results are better because underneath the breast, you know, especially in females, you cannot even tell that you had it. And, and then male is just a little cut in the side, so when you put your arm down, sometimes you don't even see it. The length to stay in the hospital, it's it's a little bit better, you know. I, I can't tell you that it's dramatically improved because it does hurt. Um, patients overall look a little bit better on the second or third day. But you know, usually the, the, the average length of stay may be short by one day. So it's really not that significant, but I think the, the intermediate recovery is what's, what, what really makes a difference. Quicker return to activities of living work, physical labor, of course, since you don't have a fracture, you don't have a broken bone, you can pretty much go back and start doing the things that you want to do. And it's, and it's a little bit less painful, perhaps. You know, I, I can tell you, I think it's uh, overall, this incision is smaller, there's less muscle cut, there's less bone in size, so it, it hurts a little bit less, but it still smarts a little. Now, who qualifies for minimum invasive surgery? It's pretty much everybody that, that is gonna have mitral surgery, aortic surgery, double valve surgery, or some of the patients have coronary artery disease, or many other operations of the heart, sometimes heart tumors, um, myxomas, um, anomalous origin of coronary arteries. Um, you know, really, there's a lot of procedures that, that we can that we can that you can utilize this approach for. So it's always good to ask your surgeon. You know, do, do I qualify to have minimum invasive? Because a lot of times, you know, things that we didn't do before, now now we do, and and, and, and a lot of people qualify for for small small uh, surgery. So the, the we're gonna limit this talk just to valve surgery. So we have four valves in the heart, two, two inlet valves and two outlet valves. The two inlet valves are the, the one on the right side is called tricuspid and the one on the left side is called mitral. And the two outlet valves, which are the valves that allow the blood to leave the heart or, or to exit the heart. The heart, of course, being a pump has inlet and outlet valves. So one is the aortic valve, which is a systemic valve, the one that allows the blood to go into the body and gives you blood pressure. And the other one, of course, the pulmonic valve, the one that allows the blood to go to the lungs before it gets oxygenated and returns to the left side of the heart. So the one that, the one that, we, we, uh, that we really 
to worry more about is the aortic valve. The aortic valve, it's really the one that's subjected to most pressure and it's under stress for many, many years. So of course, it's not only the most important valve because as the exit for the left ventricle, the oxygenated blood goes into the body through this valve. But um, it, it also tends to calcify on pretty much on, on, on everybody. If, you, if, if you're fortunate enough to live long enough, you're gonna have problems with the aortic valve. When, when between 60, 70, 80, 90, but you will get, get some problems with the aortic valve. And we usually, we usually first, you know, we, you would go to the cardiologist, they'll detect, detect a murmur, they tell you have a murmur, and you have a little bit of aortic stenosis, and then you just follow it. Uh, until you, you meet certain criteria. Once your physician tells you that you have met criteria, then it's time for, the, for, for, for some kind of aortic valve replacement to be performed. And of course, there's different choices, and we'll go through, through them. So the way, that, for, in order to perform, to perform um, the, the, the regular, did you, did you talk about TAVAR? Yes. yes. You did, okay. So th there's really two, two ways to talk about, to, to do aortic valve. The traditional way is you have to take the valve out. So they take the valve with the calcium and all the disease, you, you will go in and you open the aorta, you, have, you stop the heart, you open the aorta and you take the valve out, which is, you know, the, 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 the standard of care. Or you can, what we've been doing lately, which is least invasive is, you know, you go percutaneously through the groin and you actually deploy a valve inside your own valve and that valve opens up and just leaves the old valve there. And that, you know, we started doing it maybe about maybe 10, 15 years ago, started in, in Europe, and then, you know, got popular in the States, and now we're using, we're doing a lot, a lot, a lot. I would say the majority of valves now are doing, have been doing like that. Who's a candidate? Pretty much everybody. Um, if, you're, if you have any, uh, you know, any limitations of any kind or any, any older or, or you don't want to, if you have contraindications to cardiopulmonary bypass, you know, that's, that's the way to go. Now, if you're younger and, um, you know, less than 60 for sure, then probably traditional heart surgery, you know, with utilizing the heart lung machine, getting inside, stopping the heart, taking the valve out and putting a new valve, probably is the way to go. But the technology is changing so much that what I'm telling you right now may not be valid, you know, three years from now. So what, what I'm going to, I'm, what I'm going to talk about is about the traditional way, going utilizing the heart lung machine. So in order to, when we, when we do the, the open heart surgery, of course, we open to the sternum, we have the whole heart exposed, so we, we cannulate, we put the cannulas that, that take the blood out of the body, take it to the heart lung machine, oxygenate and return it back to the body to this little, it's like a circuit of hoses that connects the body to a machine and then oxygenate the blood and returns it while the heart stops and the lungs are still and we can, you, we can perform the operation. So when we do minimum invasive surgery, we don't have the whole exposure of the heart, because like I showed you, it's a little keyhole. So, so what we do is we, we actually access the groin. So we use, we use the groin, make a little incision in the groin, and we do this for the towers as well, either percutaneously or through a small incision, and we will uh, we'll access the heart through the femoral artery and the, and the femoral vein, which of course connect to the graded great veins and the great arteries that go all the way to the heart. So that's how, that's how we access it. And of course, this, this will be a heart-lung machine. Of course, it's, big. It's, it's a lot bigger than your heart and your lungs, but it does the same, the same, it's the same principle. It oxygenates the blood and returns it and flows it to the body. <coughs> so this will be a small incision to approach the aortic valve. So this will be the traditional surgery going through here. And this will be second intercourse space through the aortic valve. It's about a seven centimeter incision, halfway the distance between the clavicle and the spear edge of the nipple. It's about, about uh, you know, and, and right between the ribs. And we usually disconnect the, the third rib from the sternum, and then we put it back together with a little plate, and that, so there's no broken, there's, there's, a, car, there's a, a, a joint structure here. So we just articulate the joint and, and prevent it from clicking, we just put a little plate there at the end of the procedure. Of course, we, we have to go through the, through the ribs and spread the ribs apart, and then we put a little plastic retractor that, that actually brings, the, brings the, the heart closer to us by unfolding each other, and we use a little retractor. Then, and this, this of course, will be the heart, and this is the this vena cava, and vena cava, this is with the aorta, and this, this, is the, this is where the aortic valve is, this is where we'll be working. So the way we work, we make a little incision, then we, this is the whole exposure. So we don't see the whole heart, all we see is the aortic valve, the aorta, 
which we see about maybe 10, 8 centimeters of the aorta, and the aortic valve. Once we stop the heart, we have to connect to the heart lung machine through the leg. We stop the heart, we give a solution called cardioplegia. The cardioplegia actually paralyzes the heart and protects us while we're working. And then we do a transverse incision of the aorta. We see the valve, and you can see the valve is diseased. Usually the valve has three little leaflets. The leaflets are normally very pliable, much, much like the fins of a fish. They open and close, you know, and they're very elastic and, and pliable. As you get older, that, that elasticity starts going away and there's, there's calcium deposits on the leaflets and the leaflets start fusing with each other or, or growing to each other and then instead of having a nice ring with leaflets that open and close, you have like a fish mouth. The smaller the fish mouth, the harder it is for the blood to exit the heart and the more undue pressure that puts on the, on the heart. So the heart gets bigger to compensate and eventually, you know, it gives up. So once you get to certain parameters in which your physician tells you that you need to have your valve replaces because the heart is about ready to give up. So this is the way the valve looks. Usually you see the three leaflets, they're very thick. There's calcium deposits all along. All, all along. And, and, and I really mean calcium. We actually have, have to use like a little biting pliers to take it out. It's not like nice scissors that we can just cut it. Sometimes we have to take it out in pieces and it's just like, like, like stone, literally like stone. So what I'm going to show you just a little a little video of, of what what I, what I tell you what it looks like. Um, so let's see. How do you play it? This, this one is playing, of course, you see that little, that little circular retractor? And uh, we make like a little box, we spread the ribs, and, and then uh, this particular valve that you see here is similar to the tower valves that we use. So we don't, we don't use any sutures, we just, the, the valve comes in a little, a little deployment of rods, which is a lot, small, a lot shorter than the ones we use through the leg. See, it only measures about 20 centimeters, so we, we place the valve there, and uh, we just expand it the same way that, that we do that down here where the valve comes comes crimped, we put it in, we expand it, then uh, let's see. Yeah. And then this one we, we put a balloon in the balloon, you know, we put like four atmospheres of pressure and just the, the, the balloon just distends the valve and the valve kind of stays in the same position. And, and it's a very similar valve to the ones that we use here, so we don't even have to use sutures to put the valves in. But we still kind of use them sometimes, you know, I would say that a lot of times we don't have to. They're, they're, and of course, this, this makes, a, the, the procedure, makes the procedure shorter. And the valves, the valves that don't use sutures are better because the orifice through which the blood passes is much bigger. So in, in, in summary, it just, uh, uh, the, the surgery of the aortic valve has evolved from you know, mid-sternotomy to a minimum invasive to, to the tower procedure, which is what, what Dr. Hilmi already talked to you about, which, which is probably the least invasive of all. Now, um, the, 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 if you, if you um, have other, other, other problems besides the valve, let's say a coronary, coronary problems in which you have obstruction of the coronary axis, then you could probably regularly need a, valve, a bypass for you. So sometimes we combine, we do what's called a hybrid approach. So Dr. Hilmi or one of the cardiologists will come in and they, they'll put a stent on the coronary artery and then, it'll, so that way it'll, it'll, prevent, it'll prevent us from having to go through the sternum to do both things. So he'll put a stand and then we'll come in and do a minimum invasive uh, valve surgery. Um, 
but or, or or sometimes you know we'll we'll he, he'll go in and do a stand and then they'll do we'll do a tower at the same time. So everything we do is just again to try to minimize the incisions and then try to provide you with the same with the same uh, um, uh, result of, of having you know your heart fixed. <laughs> I'm gonna stop here and, and I'll try to answer any questions that, that you guys have. Anything. Can ask Dr. Hillis and see what's first. I wasn't here, so I don't know what you told us. <laughs> I don't know either. <laughs> Dr. Hilmi is my doctor, my cardiologist. You're lucky. And <laughs> yes, and I wanted to ask me also. I take aspirin because I'm supposed to take aspirin for my arteries, but if you have an aneurysm and it bifurcates, then you're going to bleed out faster, correct? The last problem you have when you have a ruptured aneurysm is the aspirin. No, but you're going to bleed faster because your you're blood's bleed. If your aspirin, if, you, if your aneurysm ruptures, aspirin is not going to make a difference. No. Okay. It's not going to make much of a difference okay. at all. And if you have small blood vessels, which I'm told I have, and you have an aneurysm and you're supposed to operate at five centimeters or six, would that be different with smaller blood vessels? Would you go with a four and a half? Would you? So, so whenever we make a decision, it has to be judged based upon the risk benefit ratio, okay? okay. If you have a, a man who's six foot four and a lady who's five foot, <laughs> The aneurysm size criteria varies. We also look at other things like symptoms, how rapidly it's expanding. So if an aneurysm is stable and we monitor it and it stays stable and you're not having symptoms and it's less than that critical uh, threshold, we usually are s fairly safe in predicting that it's not going to misbehave. But if it shows any of the signs that we predict are going to give us a problem, then we address it. We always have to balance the risk and the benefit. I give him the same trouble when I come for a visit. <laughs> yes. Yes. If you have moderate mitral valve regurgitation, mm -hmm. uh, they say you have to wait for a severe. Uh, if you're younger, would it be better to repair a moderate? They used to say that they you had to wait for more severe. Are you saying now? Well, you know, the, the, the mitral valve, the mitral valve insufficiency is very well tolerated for many years. So traditionally, uh, and I said for years and years, and even now, a lot of people just try to kind of let people go on. And, and the reason is that it's well tolerated. It doesn't give you a lot of symptoms. By the time you start getting symptoms, uh, it's usually a little late. So the new recommendations from the American Heart Association is that if your ejection fraction or the pump or the, or the, or the work, I mean, of course, there's different criteria, but in general, if the function of the heart as a pump starts decreasing even a little bit, even about 10 to 15%, and you have severe, moderate to severe mitral insufficiency, you probably should get it fixed. Um, you, the way it goes is, you know, the insufficiency creates a left atrium to the stand to become larger because it has to accommodate more volume, and then, the increase in size of the left atrium gives you arrhythmias, atrial fibrillation, which in itself, by itself, it's, it's a problem because, because of the risk of stroke. So in general, yes, it's well tolerated. A lot of people say you should wait until severe, but in, in the reality is you should get it as soon as you meet criteria. That is when you drop, you start, you, your heart starts getting dilated enough or you get, or you get uh, um, any arrhythmias or you get uh, any drop in function, which by then it should be pretty normal. You should be able to do everything you want and you should really by all means say, I bet I feel fine. That's really when you should have it, should have to have your valve repaired. And you're right, 90% of the valves should be repaired unless they're mixed lesions, stenosis with insufficiency or, or you know, they're calcified or foreshortened or we can't really repair them, then we replace them. But, but I guess the, the, the answer is no, you don't have to wait until it's, more, until it's severe. You really should get it done before it causes any damage. The other thing that we have to consider is when you look at the certain dimensions and criteria we measure by ultrasound, 
So we look at the size of the left ventricle at, at the end of systole, which is the end of contraction, and at the end of diastole, which is at the end of relaxation. And we have an index that we use to try and assess whether or not the heart is, is being compromised. Also, a lot of patients who don't have symptoms, I put them on a treadmill, and I really find out if they have symptoms or not. So some people will say, I have no symptoms, and at two minutes, they're huffing and puffing on a treadmill, then we know there's, there's an issue there with the valve. Say that again, ma'am? How is infection prevented after surgery? How is infection prevented? Infection, you mean uh, infection after the procedure or during, after? Well, you mean when you have a valve or any kind of surgery? Especially if you have an emergency surgery. Well, you know, pretty much everybody who's got any kind of surgery, pretty much it has what's called prophylactic antibiotics. So before we do any type of surgery, we have a timeout, we identify the patient, we have laterality and, and you know all the things that we have to go through to make sure everything is done properly. And one of the things is whether the patient got antibiotics, prophylactic antibiotics. So everybody gets prophylactic antibiotics, especially if you have a, a, a prosthesis of any kind. You have a valve, a total knee, a to I mean, a to any total joints, or, or a really any any implants on, on, on any part of your body. You should be very careful about about getting antibiotics. But it, pretty much everybody that we that we do surgery and gets antibiotics. And the antibiotics is only, they get one, two, or three doses. Really, they said with one is enough. People that are higher risk, sometimes we give more than one. But, but in general, they get antibiotics, and that should prevent most of the infections. On, on the uh, valve that you replaced, the artificial, is that powered by blood pressure, or is that external power to the battery? The, the, the artificial valve. Yes. How no, is it? it's it's it, you know it's 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 it really it's propelled by your own body by the by the kinetic uh, energy that the blood creates as it goes through it. So if the heart contracts and that creates an impulse, the impulse opens the valve. Okay, and then when the heart is still, there's the pressure on the it's a tubing it's a tubing system. The tubing the pressure in the tubing system is higher, and the, the back pressure makes the valve close while the heart is getting filled up. So it's just, you know, the motion, the to and fro of the of the blood going in and out of the heart, what creates the movement of the valve. So it really doesn't have any balance. It functions like a normal valve. Yeah. It's exactly the same mechanics of a normal valve. Okay. All right. We've answered it all. Yeah. All right, you guys. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. also 5.30 p.m. here at the MLB conference room. Um, now we're gonna go in and we have a couple of door prizes and I've asked Lisa oh. to help me. <laughs> yeah. Who's gonna go, you wanna talk to him? Okay. Oh, whichever, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and call the number that she's just